For Kruma Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today is South African entrepreneur and author Shumelo Biko, here to unpack his book titled Black Consciousness, A Love Story. Amongst other things, your most recent book chronicles the love affair in the late 1960s and early 1970s between your father and your mother, Steve Biko and Mampele Rampele. So tell us more about how they met and the context in which their relationship blossomed. Well, I think they met like many South Africans meet, which is uh, at university. It was both of their second years from an academic point of view. Um, my father, because of political activities, had been held back by one year. So he was uh, supposed to be a year ahead of her, and they were both in the same group. And the context of their meeting was because my mother had a next door neighbor in her dormitory who was on the SRC with my father. So even from the first meetings, uh, the discussions were political in nature. And uh, out of that um, kind of political urgency and meetings and things of that nature, they uh, developed a chemistry which a few months later turned into a relationship. And you discussed the details of the founding of South Africa's Black Consciousness Movement, the BCM, in the early 1970s. Tell us more about how the BCM helped to change the course of South African history. Well, talking about the founding, the BCM was uh, a loose organization of uh, 15 or so students who didn't define themselves as starting a entity. They were just trying to affect change. And the way that they knew how to affect change was to first change the nature of the conversation in the era that they were living in. And so the first few months of their formation was really a conversational one, uh, discussing issues of identity, uh, discussing issues of how one defines freedom, um, discussing what the context was for their participation, with the ANC having been banned and demobilized in the country and with a political vacuum having been formed, uh, they reluctantly uh, saw themselves as one of the few voices in the country that could fill that space. And they didn't just mindlessly get into the political space, they decided to do so and change everything about it. So they, they um, uh, entered the stage with the first a uh, real definition of black people in the affirmative, as opposed to non-whites, as opposed to Bantustan members, uh, as opposed to any other of the definitions that they considered to be derogatory, they decided to create an affirmative definition of what it is to be a majority citizen in the country. And they defined black in uh, broader terms than just pigmentation. It was a psychological mindset that was uh, framed in the positive. And from there, they also entered the debate about um, organizational independence and the fact that one could not achieve change without the ability to have a purist agenda that was centered around the objectives of Black people as they defined the term Black. And, and that really launched them into the national space because uh, that view found resonance in campuses around the country, and quickly journalists like yourself in that time gravitated towards the movement and began putting it on the mainstream. So that's how things evolved. And you also interviewed a number of prominent BCM leaders in research in this book. So who did you speak to and what were the main insights and memories that they offered? Well, I spoke to a number of people, you know, people that you would know, obviously Mampila Rampili, obviously Bani Pichano. Um, but there were many other people uh, that are less known who were an integral part of that first 15 members. And I was lucky enough, uh, either casually or formally, to be able to engage with them and get their views. And, and the insights I shared in the book were about the values that made them tick. And I think that's something that in this day and age, we tend to think values are a secondary thing, but they very much a primary way in which a person organizes their life and organizes their engagement with other people. And if you watch BCM people today, as they were in those days, in the early 70s, uh, late 60s, there were people that were centered around their spirituality. They were anchored in 
um, the valleys of Ubuntu, which they were all raised in. They believed in a very high standard of how human beings should interact with each other. So the promises that you make to somebody had to be honored. The little that you had had to be shared. And there was no compromising um, for the sake of comfort. And so, you know, matters of economics weren't really top of mind. What they wanted was change in the holistic sense for for black people in the country. And that meant starting amongst themselves and, and conducting themselves as a community that operated in the highest possible way from a values point of view. So I think that's what struck me. And they were able to uh, very quickly disseminate that around the country because they created a train the trainer model. So the they entire BCM structure was about creating leadership and allowing that leadership to operate in its own community. So there was never really a centralized ethos around a few leaders trying to keep power. They were always trying to create uh, an empowerment framework for somebody operating within their community to be able to find, uh, you know, the next versions of themselves in that community and and ignite them and then support them towards possibilities that uh, they would only know because every community is different. So people found that uh, BCM meant one thing in one region of the country and another. But the core ethos was the same. It was around this issue of of affirmative identity, the issue of organizational independence, and the issue of defining true freedom for Black people in a way that was uncompromising. And talk to us more about the Frilimo rally, which was planned in the early 1970s and which led to the arrest and detention of scores of BCM leaders. It's a funny one because in retrospect, everyone acknowledges how risky it was. But you can imagine me and you are now living in a war with Ukraine and Russia. But if that was on our borders and that war had ended in a way that was favorable towards people that we supported, the euphoria we'd feel is such that uh, we wouldn't be able to resist celebrating it. And I think it's in the course of planning the celebrations that issues of risk began being contemplated. Uh, And as I speak to Uncle Barney, he said he he knew the risks, but he wouldn't uh, have it in him to be able to call off a rally of that nature because he understands what Mozambique meant to South Africa at that time and uh, how important it was for them to celebrate what they've done. And so it was uh, a monumental event from the point of view of uh, raising the stakes about solidarity and um, making it clear that uh, leaders of that time were willing to do things that were harmful to their own safety in order for them to uh, stand by their values. And so when Uncle Seth Cooper recounts the story of, you know, the the increasing crescendo of, of celebration, but then confrontation with the police, it was obvious to them quite early that this would cost them their freedom, but uh, they they were willing to to suffer the consequences of their course because they thought that the symbolism of freedom in Mozambique was important for a country that was fatigued, that hadn't had a victory in a long time in terms of that scale. And uh, that's why they, they uh, went ahead and, and celebrated the Friendly Morale. Tell us about how your father ignored his burning orders to attend a set of important meetings in Cape Town, which later led to his arrest. Well, you know, banning was a normal thing by that time for them. They had lived uh, a few years with banning restrictions of various uh, severity. So sometimes very strict uh, house arrest, sometimes much looser around the township that they lived in. Um, and uh, I think if you look at interviews starting in the mid 70s, uh, it was quite clear to my father that um, he wasn't going to live forever. And, and, you know, he had a certain amount of time to affect the type of change that he wanted to. And I think that um, made the risk calculations different than me and you would take. So he knew that going to Cape Town was risky, but it was in preparation for an even more risky trip to go and meet Oliver Tumble. And he did not want to meet Oliver Tumble without the support of the people in the Western Cape. And so that trip was taken in the context of trying to unite the opposition uh, parties at the time or opposition movements 
And uh, my father has always stated that the ANC was at the vanguard of the liberation struggle, but uh, black consciousness by that time had people's hearts. And so it was a meeting of the kind of traditional liberation organization, which met um, a young national movement by that time, which had really captured the imaginations of South Africa. And so uh, I think even uh, today, one would look back and say that was worth the risk. And lastly, Sumelo, what do you think Black consciousness mean in today's South Africa? And how can South Africans embrace the core principles of Black consciousness to change the future? Well, I think it's really crazy that we haven't embraced Black consciousness as much as we should have. I mean, it's one of the few organic things that we have suffered um, in the process of creating as a nation. And what we've created in Black consciousness is a cultural transformation tool. And that tool was passed on from one generation to the next, from the 60s to the 80s. And then um, our generation haven't done the job of passing it on to the, to the next generation. And that's where we are now uh, managed by leaders who are granting us money and granting us houses and granting us education without giving us the freedom that we deserve. So in my view, um, what we've got as an outcome in this country is a powerless freedom. And to, to give South Africans the true freedom that they deserve, you have to bring back cultural transformation as part of the solution. And uh, it goes hand in hand with economic transformation because the boldness with which one enters the spaces, whether it's economic spaces or political spaces, depends on your cultural disposition. And if you feel shy about your culture, if you feel inferior in any way, uh, you will not be able to extract your pound of flesh in your discussions with people that have power. And I feel like we've missed an opportunity, but we can reclaim that opportunity by looking 20 years back or 30 years back and saying, what do those people know that we don't know today about ourselves, about our position in history, and about our relative value when it comes to negotiating with other people. And I think that to me is the place where black consciousness still has a role today and uh, will have a role going forward if we uh, don't allow the memories to die. And I think that's why I wrote this book to try and inspire the conversation to start again about uh, what we can do and what we can learn from those people. That was Shumelo Beagle speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about Black Consciousness, a love story.